Let's revise the whole of atomic structure and nuclear physics in GCSE physics. I'm going to be following the AQA physics specification. However, as always, those videos are applicable to all exam boards. So let's get started. First of all, how big, or should I say how small, is an atom? The answer is approximately 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. So this is 0 0.0000000001 meters. An atom is tiny. You guys are probably familiar with the uh, standard picture of an atomic nucleus and um, you can find the nucleus here. The nucleus, the nucleus will consist of protons and neutrons and we also have some electrons which is sort of orbiting around it um, at various different distances. Now the nucleus is tiny. It is over, so the radius of the atom is over 10,000 times larger than the radius of the nucleus. So this means that this picture here is definitely not up to scale. In fact, a standard, uh, a standard way of thinking about it is that if an atom was something like an orange in the middle of a football stadium, then an electron will be orbiting somewhere around the edges of the stadium. Additionally and interestingly, the nucleus contains most of the mass. So almost all of the mass is in this small positively charged nucleus. The electrons can actually move around, they can change energy levels, and that depends on absorbing or emitting radiation. Okay, now let's talk about mass number, atomic number, and isotopes. In order to do so, in order to do so, we're going to be considering the uh, nucleus of a helium atom. Now, what does that consist of? That consists of two protons and also two neutrons. The way we represent this is first of all with the mass number. So the mass number is simply the number of protons plus neutrons. So in this case, this is equal to 2 plus 2, which is equal to 4. This will, of course, be different for every element. For helium, it's 4. The atomic number is essentially the number of protons, like so, which is just given across here. Now let's have a look at isotopes next. So an isotope is an element with the same number of protons, but with a different number of neutrons. For instance, we have hydrogen across here, which just has one proton in its nucleus. If we were to add a neutron to that, we're going to get deuterium, which has one proton and one neutron. So to go from here to here, well, the difference is essentially is plus one neutron. Now, if we were to add yet another neutron, we are going to get tritium, which has two neutrons and one proton. Now, it's also important to note that atoms can gain or lose electrons. So if an atom loses an electron, so let's just write here that if an electron is lost, what we actually get is a positive ion and if an electron is gained so if an electron is gained we have a negative ion and in normal atoms the amount of electrons or in atoms the amount of electrons is equal to the number of protons. So our ideas of what the atom actually consists of have evolved dramatically over time. For instance, people were initially thinking that the atoms were just indivisible spheres. However, new theoretical ideas have been constantly tested with experiments and evidence from experiments helps us build new pictures. For instance, after the electron was discovered, the prevailing model was the plum pudding model, which is just represented across 
here. In the plum pudding model, we have the electrons acting, uh, or the electrons are represented essentially as plums within a pudding. The actual dough of the pudding is the positive charge. Now, this was changed by Ernest Rutherford, who did his experiments at the University of Manchester. And uh, he actually wanted to test the plum pudding model, but he ended up discovering the standard model of the atom in which we have a nucleus in which most of the mass is concentrated. The nucleus he found was positive because his alpha particles scattered and the electrons orbiting around it. But the standard model of the nucleus was re of standard model of the atom was discovered by Ernest Rutherford and for the exam you guys will need to be able to uh, compare those two models. Additionally, Niels Bohr went further after that, suggested that electrons orbit at specific distances. He actually calculated those and further on later Chadwick did some experiments to show that the nucleus itself was not an indivisible entity and it consisted of another particle as well which was known as neutrons and also protons. Now, how did we go from the plum pudding model to Rutherford's model? This was once again with Rutherford's alpha scattering experiments. What he actually did was he fired off positively charged alpha particles towards some gold foil. So he had some gold foil on one end and then he fired off some positively charged particles. If the plum pudding was correct, all the particles would have just gone through because they would have experienced on average the same force on all sides, which would have cancelled out. Um, however, this is not what Rutherford actually found out. He found that most of the particles went straight through. However, a small number of them actually bounced straight back and this indicated that they would have had a direct hit with a small nucleus at the center. Now let's talk about radiation. So some nuclei are actually unstable and what happens is that they can emit radiation. This is a completely random process. Random means that we cannot actually force it. We cannot just produce radiation. We describe it using a quantity which is known as the activity, which is the rate at which those nuclei decay. This is actually the total number of particles per second, and it's measured in this unit, which is known as the Becquerel. Given in BQ, let's just underline this. So the activity essentially is the total number of particles emitted per second. So let's just say, for instance, that let's say this nuclei here emits three particles per second, meaning that its activity will just be, well, three becquerels. Now, this is to be contrasted with the count rate, which is the amount of particles that have been measured or that have been counted typically by a GM tube. Now, why is that different? Well, imagine that I have a little detector here, like a little GM tube, like so, that's uh, then connected to a Geiger counter, etc. Now, this, pop, this um, GM tube may only actually count one of the total particles. So in the following picture, our activity will be equal to three becquerels, but our count rate will actually be just equal to one particle. Okay, well, now what are those particles? Let's consider the three different types of radiation. First of all, we have the alpha particle, which is actually the heaviest out of all of them. That consists of two protons and two neutrons. So, oops, this here should say two neutrons, just as shown as here in the picture. So two protons, two neutrons. This is essentially a helium nucleus and it has an overall positive charge because the neutrons are neutral and the two protons are positive. We can also have a beta particle, depending on the type of decay, and this is typically a high-speed electron. It could be a different particle known as a positron, which is actually uh, the positive antiparticle, and if you do A-level physics, you'll learn about that, and you should do A-level physics because it's awesome. But just stick into the electron, the beta particle will have a negative 
charge. You can also have gamma radiation, which is high frequency radiation. In fact, it's EM radiation. Think of it just as light, but with a much higher frequency and much higher energy and penetration power. So in the nuclear decay equation, we can actually represent the alpha particle with the following equation. So we'll just write this down over here. Because it's the same as a helium nucleus, it can be represented by helium for two. Remember, the two here is just the number of protons and the four here is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. A beta particle is just an electron that has a negative charge, so we're going to have a minus one here that has no protons and no neutrons, so this one here will be given as zero. And now let's see whether we can balance a nuclear decay equation. So we're starting off with carbon-14, which is an isotope of carbon, a radioactive isotope of carbon, and then we get nitrogen. We also get a beta particle emitted, and um, all we need to do is just balance out the numbers. So the first thing that we need to do is balance out the top. So we have 14 overall on the left hand side and here we don't know what this is this one here is 0 so whatever this is plus 0 has to give us 14 so this one here has got to be 14 okay so we have 6 across here and whatever number we have here take away 1 has got to give us 6 so the only way this could happen is if this one here is 7 so just a quick check we have a 6 overall here for the atomic number 7 take away 1 is equal to 6, we've got 14 here, we've got 14 here, so this equation has been balanced. Just a little note that if you do this at A level, this is not the complete reaction. You don't need to know this for your GCSEs, but this is not actually the complete equation, so I'm going to write this in brackets. You also get something known as the anti-neutrino, and typically you get a photon or a particle of light with some uh, energy out as well, but you don't need to know this for your GCSEs. Okay, well, let's do another example. We have radon-21986 that decays into polonium-84215. Uh, what is the mystery particle that is released? Well, all we need to do is just take away those numbers. So we need to balance them out. 219 will be 215 plus 4 because 219 take away 215 is just 4. So we know that the mass number will just be 4. 86 take away 84 will just be 2. 4, 2. Or this is just a helium nucleus or as it's known an alpha particle. And we have essentially solved and balanced out this nuclear equation. Okay, so on to half-life next. The half-life of a radioactive isotope is the time it takes for the number of nuclei in the sample to half. We can find this from a graph pretty easily if we have the number of particles and then we have time on the x-axis, the graph will typically go down like this. Now, in order to find a half-life, all we need to do is find the half-wave point of the particle. So we're starting off with 100, so therefore when we get to 50, the number of particles is actually halved, and all we need to do is essentially trace the time that that actually corresponds to. So in this graph, if I was to do that, we can see that the half-life of this particular sample is one hour. So we can just say that t half, typically we write it like that, is equal to one hour of this graph. Now we can also use the half-life to do some calculations. For instance, we have a portion of a radioactive substance that has 2,000 particles and its half-life is around 10 seconds. Calculate the number of particles left after 30 seconds. Okay, so every half-life, essentially, the number of particles halves. So after 10 seconds, we're going to have 2,000 times a half. This is after 10 seconds. After 20 seconds, we're going to multiply this by half. And after 30 seconds, we're going to apply one more half to this equation, which is equal to 2,000 multiplied times 1 over 8, which is just equal to 250 particles.
And now let's talk a little bit about radioactive contamination. That is just the unwanted presence of essentially radioactive materials that have been uh, that have contaminated something else. Now the hazard comes from their decay. So if something is radioactive and it's contaminated something else, then that can become very very dangerous. For instance, it can be emitting alpha and beta particles, which might damage the tissue and they become inhaled, etc., which can be really 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 bad. Now this is to be contrasted with irradiation. That is the process of just exposing exposing an object to nuclear radiation. And the trick is that the, um, the object does not become radioactive, it's just been exposed to radiation, which uh, of course it can also be dangerous, but we need to be aware of the difference between the two. We also need to know what background radiation is, and that is around all the time. So there's loads of natural sources which uh, contain radioactive substances. So something like a piece of, well, rock, can be a little bit radioactive, meaning that um, it's emitting a few particles per second. There's also these cosmic rays that are striking the atmosphere all the time. Uh, something like a, uh, like a banana, for instance, contains a little bit of radioactive things, polonium, and it will set off a Geiger counter, but that's nothing to be worried about. And uh, certain occupations, for instance, will um, have a higher dose of natural background radiation. So something like a flight attendant, for instance, will experience a higher dose of natural background radiation or an astronaut because they're not protected by the uh, by the Earth's atmosphere, which acts uh, essentially like a shield. Now, nuclear radiation can also be used. It is extensively used in medicine, for instance, for the exploration of internal organs. So there's all sorts of radioactive traces, for instance, that can be injected into the body and in very, very small doses, and they can be used to image, produce a live picture of what's actually happening inside of a patient which is amazing and we can also um, use them for the control destruction of unwanted tissue so we can target something like cancers for instance relatively effectively with, um, with radiation. Now let's talk about nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. So nuclear fission is the splitting of a larger nuclei into smaller ones. So we start with a heavy nucleus and that then splits into a couple of others which are smaller and some energy is also released during this reaction. Now typically in order for this to, to happen a neutron must be absorbed and this is Illustrated over here is actually a process known as the chain reaction, which uh, you guys need to be able to recreate. Of course, without the numbers, but you can have a fast-moving neutron which hits a uranium nucleus that produces two other nuclei, but also each reaction produces its own neutron that then hits another nucleus that then releases two more neutrons and then the whole process keeps repeating itself until you have a chain reaction. Now we can control this reaction within a nuclear reactor but it's something as a nuclear explosion for instance this reaction may uh, be uncontrolled. Now this is contrasted to nuclear fusion in which two lighter nuclei, for instance something like hydrogen can, or deuterium and hydrogen can fuse together to uh, form helium and this actually happens inside of a core of a star but you can have those two and they might fuse together to form a larger nucleus. Now in that process some of the mass is converted to energy by E is equal to mc delta squared actually. Um, MC via E is equal to MC squared, but you guys don't really need to know about this. What you need to do though is have a look at this next video, which will really help your revision. And thank you very much for watching. Click over here.